You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. This is Andy Tanner speaking. I am your host. This is where we do our very best to make investing simple. And today we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency, uh, trust, blockchain. Uh, we might touch on the, the issues uh, with FTX and the recent news there. And I have the perfect person uh, to do this. We have Omid Malikin, who is an adjunct professor at Columbia University, which intimidates me right out of the gate. I'm a big Warren Buffett fan, as you all know, and that's where Warren Buffett attained his degree. So it's the, probably the close, closest I'll ever get to uh, Columbia University. So, Amid, thank you for spending time with us. It's wonderful to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. I, and I really mean that when I say uh, I get intimidated because academically, you know, I was a I was a really bad basketball player who was barely uh, good enough to be a student, <laughs> and so. Uh, <laughs> but I'm grateful for the opportunity on this podcast because we get to bring in the best of the best, and people who really do do things you know every day. And um, you teach this, and you're known as. Uh, I guess the explainer in chief uh, often when it comes to helping people understand uh, this new this new technology. So first of all, why don't you give us just a little bit of your background and what is it that uh, brought you to uh, want to learn and and lecture on this particular topic? Because you know, no one comes to the table and says, "Oh, I've been doing crypto for you know fifty years, and here's what I know." Um, you know, this is kind of new for all of us. What is it, uh, you know, what was your background and what brought you to this point? It's a great question because, um, I actually originally have a wall street background when I was in my first career, uh, I was a trader and then I also had jobs in other sort of tangential finance related positions. And this was long before uh, the even the invention of Bitcoin, uh, which is now, what, 12 years old. Yeah. Um, so I had a good understanding of sort of the plumbing of finance, of how we track who owns what and what kind of financial institutions people typically deal with in investing, things like banks, brokerages, exchanges, et cetera. Uh, and then around um, 2013, I was introduced to Bitcoin by a friend of mine and um, I was, to be frank, I wasn't that interested. And uh, like many of your listeners uh, probably are today, I was thoroughly confused because I do not have a technical background and there's a lot about uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency that is very, uh, in, uh, very technical and sometimes intimidatingly so. That said, my friend asked me to help her purchase a little bit of Bitcoin. And uh, when I did that, um, well, well, the purchasing part was actually uh, felt very similar to me. Uh, you, know, you, you open an account at a cryptocurrency exchange. I used Coinbase at the time for her. Um, and that process, that part of the process was just like how one would open a brokerage account for stocks, for example. And, or you deposit funds from your bank account and you buy something. What really caught my attention though is when I went to transfer her coins to a wallet on my own computer, that's something you don't get to do uh, mm -hmm. with your stocks. And I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't really understand any of it. I just followed a tutorial. But lo and behold, some minutes later, my computer popped up an alert that said, your coins are now here. And I was immediately sort of mesmerized because the one thing that never happens with traditional financial services is that you don't directly own anything, right? Like normally, if you have a bank account or a broker's account, if you own stocks or bonds or anything like that, there's usually a army of financial institutions that sit between you and the assets for good reason. But here I was and I had some Bitcoins, whatever that meant. And I also knew enough to know that if I made any kind of mistake, like if I, I don't know, my computer crashed or I forgot a password, then the coins would be gone forever, or at least I would lose access to them. 
And this also really intrigued me because it meant that for the first time, a purely digital asset that only exists on the internet now sort of had this physical property, right? Like although Bitcoin only exists on the internet, the way it behaves is more like the $20 bill you might have in your wallet or if you go back a long time ago when people used to use stock certificates to yeah. track who owns what. So that was the beginning of, uh, of sort of like my, my trip down the rabbit hole. Initially, I was just curious how it all worked. It was like a hobby of mine for a number of years. Um, but then as time went on and the technology improved and there were newer uh, blockchains that could do more than Bitcoin did, that's when I formed the theory that I present in the book that at the end of the day, trust is the most important thing in, well, in everything, but certainly in financial interaction and that this really confusing thing called the blockchain is actually a better way to build trust for things like cryptocurrencies, but ultimately even for things for how we uh, make payments in dollars or make investments in companies. So, and you mentioned this, and, and this is important, is that trust is is really the, the central title of your new book, Re-Architecting Trust, The Curse of History and the Crypto Cure for Money markets and platforms it's available at amazon.com we'll talk more about that but uh trust in in my mind is the central issue you know i i don't think the word confidence is the same as trust perhaps they're perhaps they're related but a person uh a person's gonna you know a currency's power is really based in in my mind from what i've learned about markets or what i believe about markets is uh is based on on confidence and that has shifted throughout uh, throughout history. What I think is fascinating is uh, my grandfather was a gold bug, hmm. and so it was gold, gold, gold. And he was from Germany, and he uh, he understood the uh, the Weimar Republic and hyperinflations and uh, the evils or potential problems, I suppose, of, of printing lots of currency and having a, a central uh, a central place where you could just print, 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 and how how that could get out of control. So I grew up being taught, you know, the evils of currency and and how important gold was. So there's many people like that. And in 1971, when uh, the dollar, for example, was taken off the gold standard, many people said, well, you know, gold is money. Uh, Now the dollar is, uh, is no longer uh, real money. And, you know, this is going to doom everything. And the dollar's now trash. We just will burn them there. This worthless piece of paper. (laughs) And in my mind, I I always think about, you know, there's two sides to every argument. Perhaps um, that was really, I mean, we used to use feathers or shells or, you know, whatever it is we thought, you know, you'd have a, you'd have uh, tally sticks for taxation and things. These things evolve. And part of me thinks maybe, uh, 71 actually was the end of gold uh, as a currency. And now we have a digital world, a, a technological world, and, uh, and here we are in the next evolution. So I guess the thing, uh, the, 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 there's, there's so many different questions I want to ask. I want to begin with, with, uh, with this one. Is, uh, should we become, what, are there dangers of becoming dogmatic with crypto? Because I see this a lot. I see people that uh, say this is the next new thing. They attach themselves emotionally to it. And as a trader on Wall Street, you know what that can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, They attach themselves emotionally to it. They say, listen, Bob, this is the future. No ifs, ands, or buts. You don't get on the, the, the train here. You're going to be left behind. Do you see any of that in crypto? Do you see people that just, uh, just flat out believe in it almost like a, a, a political affiliation or a religion perhaps where they say, Hey, this is just it. Or do you think, uh, do you think it's, there's some legitimate, uh, beef that they have to say, Hey, this is it. This is new. This is how it's going to go. Where do you stand on that? I, I see too much of the dogmaticness and, and the religious like belief in crypto. Uh, and I think that actually uh, hurts its 
branding and adoption in a lot of ways. Cause, cause as you said, even with gold, and by the way, I love the fact that you know what tally sticks were. <laughs> uh, Let's burn really, the tally sticks. <laughs> right. But you know, I come at this from a place of just fundamentally understanding how the world works today and why we got here. Um, and then how we can make it better. And as vanilla as that sounds, I do think that's the right path to progress. Mm -hmm. And what you see in crypto, whether it's the people who are the, uh, like you said, the religious believers that fiat currency is evil and it's only a matter of time until the dollar collapses completely and something like Bitcoin will replace it. I don't agree with them. Uh, mm -hmm. but, and they're, they're really like two sides of the same coin of the people who say that, you know, like sadly uh, Warren Buffett uh, and Charlie Munger, that this is all just fraud and a scam. Yeah. And I think, what did Charlie Munger say? Rat poison squared or he, something like that. He, he's used some, uh, some interesting uh, descriptions to yeah. describe his feelings <laughs> <laughs> about, uh, uh, I mean, we're PG-13 here, so I don't know. It's probably right on the edge of what he said. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and part of why they're so skeptical might be because they're just reacting to the, the crypto reactionaries. And I think they're all equally ignorant in some ways. And uh, ultimately, you know, money, like, like you mentioned, has had this, this remarkable history. And it's just such a weird thing because it is completely a human invention and it's yep. actually just really a way that we can trust each other right? like if we don't if i don't know you and you don't know me as long as we trust the same currency then at least we can do business together but it's gone through this fantastical cyclical evolution where not only have there been different kinds of money like you alluded to everything from shells um to uh today you know fiat money is just really promises but yeah. promises that can come from credible institutions like governments um but also there's always this cyclicality to money that there are, there have been these currencies that like the dollar today um because they are initially very trustworthy for various reasons reach these amazing heights of adoption and stability and faith. Yeah. But, this, but then that sort of becomes their undoing. And this is what I call the curse of history that the more trusted a currency becomes, then the more likely whoever is responsible for it or issues it starts to take shortcuts, loses discipline. Some would argue that the excess money printing we saw during COVID or during the 2008 crisis is an indication that we are now on like the, the downward side of this cycle mm -hmm. that perhaps central banks are a little overconfident in their ability to print and print and still not devalue the money. But nevertheless, I put cryptocurrencies into the category of the natural evolution of money. And, and mind you, like everything else in life, there are good cryptocurrencies and there are bad ones. And, and, and probably most of them are actually not great. But nevertheless, uh, something like a Bitcoin to me in some ways makes sense just because in the last 20, 30 years, the world has digitized and so much yeah. of our interaction is online. And yet our money is not, um, yes. or at least the design of our financial system. You know, a lot of people now use fintechs and uh, you know, things like Venmo or they do online banking, but the design of those services is the same exact design that we had 50 years ago. We just moved them on the internet. And what's interesting about crypto is one way to think about it is with, with asking this question, if we were to redesign the financial system from the ground up, taking into account the fact that we're all mostly connected and have quite capable electronic devices in our pockets, what kind of financial system would we build? It, th this is, I'm electrified by our uh, conversation already, Omid, because I've, I generally, when I speak with someone, and I started with dogmatism for a reason, because generally, when I speak with someone, they're for or against. They're Democrat, they're Republican, they're theist, they're not, they're atheist. I mean, it's just, it is such a line. And I feel like I've found someone that feels the same way about it that I do. Is 
I, when I was a young boy, I think it was one of my teachers in school, and I, I feel terrible. I can't remember which one it is because it was a great introduction. But they gave me this concept of a Ben Franklin tea where you would just make a tea and you'd say, okay, on this side are the good things and on this side are the bad things. And you're kind of a, instead of rhetorical goals of trying to make a case for Bitcoin or anything else, we just say, okay, what's good and bad about it? And I'd like to talk about things I think are good. Maybe you can tell them where I'm off or where I'm on or, or if we share the opinion or disagree. Uh, first of all, blockchain to me, I think is one of the most fascinating type of technologies uh, to, to be brought about. And if we removed it from the idea of money, I'm, I'm beside myself, and this leads into a, a different question, but I'm beside myself nearly that we don't use this in, uh, to vote, for example. Uh, hmm. When you talk about trust, um, this to me, this would be, uh, a, a massive, like a quantum leap in terms of, of elections and, and the trust that should be there. Uh, why don't we use this to, uh, why is it so much, when people hear, hear blockchain, they immediately equate this with some type of new money technology, when actually this is simply, you mentioned money is a promise. Um, this is about recording uh, transactions, recording contracts, recording. It's just simply a ledger. It's just a record of what was said or what was done or what was exchanged uh, that is uh, so linked together and, you know, double checked. When you were in school, uh, sometimes the teachers say, have your neighbor check your work, right? <laughs> uh, and so you would pass, everyone passed their paper to left and and then you were hoping your buddy would be kind to you. <laughs> At least that's what I was hoping. <laughs> I mean, that might be like way oversimplified, but that's what we try to do here is, isn't blockchain simply like back in school where you pass your paper to your neighbor? It's just that everyone in the class checks it. Like every student would check it. In a lot of ways, yeah, I like that analogy. Uh, going back to that trust building, so ledgers are in some ways one of the greatest human inventions ever, and we use them for literally everything. Like one way to think about your life is you exist as records on ledgers, everything from yeah. the Social Security Administration to your bank to even like the grades that my students will get yeah. at the end of the semester. And blockchain itself, if we remove it from the currency application, is in a lot of ways just a better ledger. Yeah. Um, just to give a few examples of how, uh, one is it it's uses cryptography to become immutable. That's just a fancy way of saying once something goes in, you can't change, change it. it. Yeah. Which for any application that requires an audit trail, including voting, is great. Um, like it's kind of crazy when you think about it, that all of the ledgers I mentioned, you know, the social security administration to student grades are such that any, anybody who has access to it could go in and just change something, even something that was recorded five years ago. Yeah. Uh, and that's not great. So if you have a database that you can't do that, that's useful. Uh, and then if it's also, we say they're distributed. So instead of like there being one copy or maybe three copies, if there's redundancy, there is this idea with blockchain that anybody can keep their own copy. So I, I actually happen to run something right here in my office that's called the Bitcoin node, but it's really like I keep a copy of the Bitcoin ledger for myself. Um, and it updates in real time as new transactions are entered into it. And it's again, one of those things that's like, why not do that? I have internet. I actually have just like a $200 cheap, really cheap mini computer doing this. So th there are many, features of blockchain that make it applicable to all sorts of activities, some of which have nothing to do with investing or money. Uh, those applications are actually being developed as we speak, and I, there are people looking into using it for voting. However, I do want to add one thing, which is that while it is tempting to say, let's just separate the database technology from the money or the currency that it empowers, they tend to work best together uh, for a very specific reason. And, and I say this because I actually, in my, in my corporate and consulting life, early on I worked on projects where you had things like banks trying to use blockchain just to improve 
financial record keeping for you know, bonds and mm-hmm. stuff like that, mm-hmm. having nothing to do with the cryptocurrency. These are what we call private blockchains or uh, permissioned blockchains, meaning unlike Bitcoin, where nobody needs permission to do anything, anybody, you know, like I can keep a copy for myself if I want to. Sure. Permissioned blockchains are ones where you have some kind of a gatekeeper that says, okay, I'm the government and here's who's going to get to participate in the blockchain for voting. Or I am banking consortium and only these banks can access this blockchain. Uh, On the surface, that's a perfectly valid application of the technology. A lot of big companies and some governments have spent a lot of money in the last five years trying to develop it. But as it turns out, you know, we're all learning as we go. It's none of those projects have gotten anywhere in yeah. part because there are many reasons for which a blockchain is actually a very inferior database. They're very slow, for example. They're very complex to operate. When we move to the cryptocurrency application, the, the currency is tied to the ledger because the currency is actually what secures the ledger. So without getting into the details too much, you can't have a Bitcoin blockchain without Bitcoin because the security falls apart. And what we've seen is that not so much for Bitcoin, but for some of the newer cryptocurrency enabled networks like Ethereum, which is the second most prominent one, you need a currency to secure it in decentralized fashion to keep it this open, uncontrolled thing that no government or corporation can impose their will on. But then you can just treat it like a platform on top of which you can do everything from pay dollars, very popular application on uh, Ethereum to trade what we call tokenized securities. Those are just things like stocks and bonds that exist on a public blockchain to potentially even do voting tracking someday. So I I look at this positive side of the ledger first, and we begin with this amazing technology that that, uh, seems very well suited, uh, immutable, distributed, all the things we mentioned. There, there's also another interesting thing I think is attractive to it is when you involve a human being, you have someone who has emotions, you, someone, you have a, a creature that, that has both a logical brain, but also an emotional brain. Uh, I often, you know, talk with my friends, say, you know, we felt before we thought, meaning that if you look at evolutionary you know, an amoeba doesn't think about stuff. It just does what it feels right. It's a chemical. Oh, this is food. So I attack it. Oh, this is a predator. So I run. It's not a thinker. It's a feeler. We still have a lot of that in our, in our brains. I believe anyway, because when I look at markets and their volatility, as soon as you, as soon as you have a marketable security, there's an immediate detachment or potential for detachment from fundamentals, uh, tulip mania, is not about logic. It is about emotion. Greed, Bernie Madoff, Weimar Republics, all of these flaws, these, well, it, you, you, this might fall into the curse of history part of your book where you have human elements where there's evil men who will you know, exploit to get power and, and gain, and then you have ignorant men who make mistakes or, or imperfect brains, uh, things evolve. So the idea of a humanless uh, system, right? A, a, a system that is immutable in the fact that says, here are some rules that are, that are unbreakable even by the flawed human beings. That's kind of a cool thing because in my family, when my wife and I got married, we kind of sat down and we said, let's make some rules that are unbreakable and let's make a contract that says, here's some things about our marriage that are immutable, that, that we don't get to control, that are bigger than us. And, uh, and so, you know, whenever they come up, like we have no power of them. It's like burning the boats. It's like, Hey, we're here. We burn the boats. This is what we have. Uh, that's what marriage is supposed to be, you know, until death you part, better, worse, bonded, welded, sealed, uh, no, no, no bill of divorcement is allowed here. That type of commitment. So that seems like a good thing on the, on the positive side of the ledger. But the way I see it, uh, human beings have kind of in their own mind, uh, they think the world is theirs to run. Uh, they don't see themselves as a part of nature. They see themselves as a, a, a creature that dominates over it, that the world was created for them to you know, colonize and resource and extract from the world. I just don't think that, that, that the powers that be 
Look at China and how they've dealt with blockchain. Uh, look at the United States. Are men really willing to give up that power? So if I'm in Argentina and I have inflation that is just ridiculous and, and my currency is all over the place and I feel like I can circumnavigate my government and I can circumnavigate and have a store of, of, of wealth or store of value outside of this government system that's making my life hard, I can see where that would be really, really exciting. But, and, and even El Salvador or a government like that might even embrace that idea. But China won't embrace that. Uh, and they have the most people. So what are your thoughts about crypto's ability or potential to become trustless where we eliminate not men, but the people with the power? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question. And I like that you mentioned trustless. So maybe we could define for your listeners. The idea of something being trustless is counterintuitive, but when something is trustless, it means that you can trust the outcome without having to trust any individual or organization. So a, a trivial example of that is like if you use Microsoft Excel, you trust that the, the formulas will be correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Counterintuitively, if you uh, invest in a fund run by a guy named Bernie, or more recently, unfortunately, a crypto exchange run by a guy named Sam, yeah. you are trusting that they don't do things like run a Ponzi scheme or abscond with your money and, and do other things with it. Right. So we want all else being equal as much of society to be as trustless as possible for the reasons that you said. People are fallible. People are both emotional and sometimes they think the wrong way. And th this is ultimately you know, the, the holy grail in every application of blockchain and cryptocurrency is this idea of trustlessness. Uh, with Bitcoin, it just began with something really simple, which is uh, a kind of money where instead of central bankers determining the supply, it's just fixed by a simple math formula. And then also, I can send you Bitcoins and I don't, neither me or you has to trust each other, nor do we have to trust a bank, a credit card company, a payment processor, et cetera. Right. Uh, right. That's what it began. And then with the newer networks like Ethereum, we add this great functionality. It's, it's the poorly named smart contract. Um, a smart contract is not like a digital or blockchain version of a legal contract. Smart contracts are really just simple conditions that are added to transactions. Yeah. So with Bitcoin, all I can do is just say, I want to send you a Bitcoin now. But on Ethereum, I can say, hey, I want to send you a cryptocurrency, but only if certain conditions are met. And those conditions could be little simple ones like, you know, uh, on the first of the month, or they could be uh, more complicated. Like if there's, maybe we place the bet on the Super Bowl, so depending on the winner. Um, or maybe it's actually an insurance product. So if it, if it rains a certain amount in your neighborhood or something like that. And what we can do there, and all the uh, smart contracts are just code. You just write software that says, if this, then that. But the conditions are executed in trustless fashion, uh, which means as long as you wrote the code correctly, you get exactly what everyone expects. And on the one hand, this is going to be great from just making the financial system and beyond more reliable because once you, even something as simple as like an interest payment, a dividend payment for a stock today, a lot of that is done through manual processing and we need, we need a lot of regulations to make sure that whoever is doing the manual processing does it right. You move it onto the blockchain and it's literally code and it's transparent code. Anybody can go read it ahead of time before you make yourself a subject to its conditions and say, yeah, I can tell, you know, this is going to pay me if, if I place the right bet on the Super Bowl. And so this is going to be great for users, but to get to the second part of your question, it does challenge both the authority and in a more pedestrian way, the profitability. <laughs> yes. A lot of corporations and governments are like, if we can uh, replicate a Super Bowl bet on the blockchain, then you don't really need a casino and you can even make it. So there's no take whatsoever, right? Like, cause I don't know how much sports folks gambling sites take, but it might be 10, 20, 30%. 
And because the money's on the blockchain, we don't have to worry about like somebody running away with it. So they're going to have issues with this. And, and governments in particular, as you alluded to, um, particularly in places like the Argentinas of the world, where their governments are not really trustworthy. They're not trustworthy in terms of their ability to maintain the purchasing power of their currency, nor are they trustworthy in terms of not being corrupt. You know, like part Correct. of one of the perks in many countries of being a government official is that you get to call the bank and tell them to give somebody else's money to you. Yep. Um, and all of that becomes a lot harder to do in this more digital, decentralized, trustless world of crypto. So I do think you're hinting at something that we're already starting to see, which is this like epic struggle for power where you might have a lot of people eventually. And I think this is going to be one of the things that, that really proves the utility of crypto, which is that you're going to have people in places like Argentina or Turkey or any country that has a lot of inflation where their citizens no longer have to go to the back alley to get hundred dollar bills from the money changer. Now they just need a wallet and you can actually get dollars on the blockchain. They're actually ironically one of the most important or not one of the most popular things that people do with crypto is, is hold and trade dollars. Mm -hmm. And now for companies that want to have capital controls, that force their citizens to use their crummy domestic currency despite the inflation and corruption, they're going to have a problem because since this is all on the internet and digital, it's a lot harder to stop yeah. than when people would like uh, try to use the banking system or like move bundles of cash around. We're speaking with Omid Malikan. He is an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School. His book is Rearchitecting Trust. The Curse of History and the Crypto Cure for Money, Markets and Platforms. I'm so grateful for, you know, I spoke earlier about, you know, how much, how much time we would have. And this is like, this is gold for people. I, that's no pun intended. This is like, <laughs> but, uh, but, but here, here's some interesting, I, there's so many different implications that this has. As we look at how people like I look at um, one, one of the things that people push back against me when I like the dogmatism is unbelievable because if I ever bring up a problem with Bitcoin in the mm. wrong, in the wrong group, I, I immediately lose credibility. <laughs> I'm, I'm ostracized. You're, you're an idiot. Oh. It's, it, it's interesting, but here's one of the, the holes I poke in, in, in Bitcoin specifically, not, not crypto, but Bitcoin. Uh, and the analogy or the metaphor I, I, I submit for this idea goes something like this. We had this amazing information age, this, this revolution with the World Wide Web. And the, the protocol uh, or the coding that's used to communicate through the World Wide Web is called Hypertext Transfer Code Protocol. So before the www dot whatever you are, you have an HTTPS hypertext transfer protocol. So we're transferring text basically through this very specific protocol. And that protocol has endured. It has been uh, something that has just been, you know, world changing. Well, when we had this protocol introduced, for many people, my, my age, the, the older people, we use Netscape. And mm -hmm. a lot of people much like a tissue and a Kleenex could become synonymous, Netscape and the internet were the same thing. Uh, I'm going to get on Netscape and I'm going to define this. So what, who uses Netscape now? The, the nature of technology is exponential improvement. And I look at Bitcoin as a Netscape. I said, let me tell you something. Uh, it was the first one but it's not perfect and because it's not perfect there will be a better mousetrap for sure there will be a better mousetrap for example one of the critiques of of bitcoin is uh is a is a carbon foot, footprint issue when you have a ledger of this size it takes a lot of energy to uh unlock the next block and figure out that little puzzle uh, to unlock the next block but it also takes tremendous energy to double check this thing 
every time there's a transaction, you, the whole class gets to grade your paper. That's a lot of that's a lot of power <laughs> in the classroom, a lot of mental, you know, exhaustion from the classroom when you have, you know, a classroom of how many million people double checking everything. And so my my thought is is yeah, crypto as far as blockchain is, it's just going to get better and it's going to improve. And who's to say that that blockchain itself uh, doesn't have obsolescence risk? Uh, how do we come to a place where we say, aha, this is it. This is the final technology. Uh, blockchain is what is going to be it, and it's going to run the world. And because it's immutable, you know, we'll never do any better than that. Uh, no, I, I think we will do better than that. I think someone will invent something, either a better use for blockchain or even a better, a superior technology, because we're always trying to build a better mousetrap. What do you think? Is that... Uh, am I stepping on sacred ground? <laughs> no, no. I, I actually, I love the fact that you began by talking about uh, protocols like HTTP or even before SMTP. that, the, yeah. right? The, the email and just the, the internet protocol IP. So um, uh, in crypto, what we call Bitcoin and Ethereum, those are actually also protocols. Protocols just in, in computer science is the rules by which the participants in the network connect and exchange yeah. information. The original internet protocols were about moving bits of data. Uh, crypto protocols are about more about moving units of value. Um, and, and the funny thing is, like Bitcoin, the uh, in the early days of the internet, there were other competing protocols. And some of them were actually arguably better. Yeah, there were some there's some serious limitations to things like TCP IP, mm -hmm. and there were some very smart people who got together and um, came up with better alternatives in the years afterwards. It's just that in networks in general, there is this tendency that the first thing it's not the best technology that wins. It's usually the first technology that reaches a certain level of critical mass that takes over. And that's true for so many things. Like I guess some would argue like the, if you look at the metric system versus the system that we right. use, you know, like, you know, right. It, it, old I'll say, hey, metric is better, but there's no way America, you know, like pipes, plumbing, we have half inch, quarter inch yep. pipes and wrenches and good point. And good, point. Not gonna switch. good point. Um, so I think in crypto in particular, because security is so important. Once, a protocol has proven itself secure. It's really hard to just many people show up on an almost daily basis and say, Hey, I have a better mousetrap and they're probably right on the merits, but then it's like, yeah, but we've already coalesced and around this Bitcoin thing and it is secure. So we don't want to risk trying something different. However, the, the energy consumption and the environmental critique is very valid. I'll start by saying it is one thing to note is that a lot of people think of Bitcoin's electric consumption as uh, a bug, but really it's a feature. Um, the way it Bitcoin becomes trustworthy and secure, even though it's decentralized and even though literally anybody could do anything is because the participants who do the most important work of updating the ledger uh, they need to have skin in the game and they basically prove honest intent by wasting money. Mm. That's why they have to use electricity because they waste money in their local currency. So if I'm mining here, which I'm not, right. but if I was, I would be spending dollars. And then if I do a good job, the network rewards me in Bitcoins. So all else being equal, I have a vested interest in, in Bitcoin succeeding because I want the, the my revenues to come in a coin that, preserves value. So that means I'm going to do what I can. I have an incentive to contribute to the trustworthiness of the system. The downside of that, of course, is that it is a lot of electricity. However, I think we have to look that look at it in the broader context. And actually, first, there's a little nuance to this because you've heard the stats and a lot of people have heard, oh, Bitcoin uses more electricity than yeah, yeah. Norway or something. <laughs> um, which which might be true, but it's funny. You never hear that argument made against anything else. But if you look at any human activity in aggregate, it uses more electricity than the Norway. Some small. Yeah. Right. Like 
My favorite example is email would be the same. I'll bet you the amount, yeah. the amount, you know, to turn on a computer and send an email, uh, you know, you could run California probably for 75 years or right. some crazy, <laughs> you know, or, or I, I, this, that I know for sure. Cause I found the reference to it. Air conditioning, the U S uses more electricity for air conditioning than the UK does in aggregate. Wow. Um, but at the end of the day, life and business is about cost and benefit. So the question is mm-hmm. like, is it worth it? Right. Is all that electricity that's used for air conditioning or Bitcoin worth it? And that's something that individuals will have to decide. And ultimately the market will have to decide. It is a changing dynamic because while Bitcoin does use a lot of, or Bitcoin mining uses a lot of electricity, unlike wow most industrial activities or air conditioning, Bitcoin mining is the kind of thing you can a do literally anywhere in the planet or even in space. Mm -hmm. Uh, and B you can turn it on and off whenever you want to. So what we're seeing in the last couple of years is increasingly Bitcoin is moving to renewable energy, uh, in part because there are many places like Texas in the U S where, there's an excess of renewable power and they just don't have the transmission lines to get that power to where it's needed. Um, and people are also uh, deploying Bitcoin mining in places where you have completely wasted energy. Uh, so one example is when uh, offshore drillers are drilling for oil, they will often hit pockets of natural gas. They don't have the pipelines to send that natural gas anywhere. So they end up burning it off. Uh, but what you can do is you can actually set up a Bitcoin miner and there are companies that are doing this. So it's, it, it's, it's footprint will improve in terms of at least like the carbon footprint, but ultimately the question comes to utility is something like this where people have this ability to convert power into money in a decentralized fashion, useful for society uh, and I believe that it is because as, as I'm sure you can appreciate historically, there's actually a very strong connection between money and power. One way to think about the U S dollar as the global reserve currency is that it is backed by the power of the U S military That's it. directly or indirectly. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting about Bitcoin is you sort of have decentralized money that that does this. And it's not so much the threat of guns that makes people use Bitcoin, but it's the appeal of decentralized and non-inflationary money. Um, all of that said, Bitcoin is extremely limited in utility. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can use it, you can use it to hold your you know, store and invest in Bitcoins and you can use it to send it to other people. Yeah, it's, That's it's, it. It, it. It really shouldn't be called a a currency in that currency implies movement, you know, electrical current, uh, you know, ocean current. And, and originally when it was introduced to me, I thought, Oh, this is how I'm going to buy a pizza. Uh, no, <laughs> or, you know, I mean, you know, that's what currency is. I'm going to go to work and my, my employer is going to pay me in these coins someday. And when I go to the grocery store, I'm going to buy the stuff in these coins someday, but it's really become more of a store uh, if much like the gold that I own, that's, that's very much how I see it. It's almost becoming a, a, a you know, a commoditized investment, perhaps, um, mm-hmm. not really but security, one, but yeah, but it, it's, it is. And, and it, in the last couple of years, it's particularly taken on this digital gold narrative, but yeah. Yeah. it's, it's digital gold that anybody can own anywhere on the planet and send to anybody else. And I think that's a useful thing, not to buy pizzas or earn a salary. There are actually many reasons why you wouldn't want to do that in Bitcoin. I mean, just look at its crazy volatility. Right. But I think Bitcoin is like going to evolve into being this sort of break glass in case of emergency money. Mm -hmm. That whether you are an American who's worried about double digit inflation, a Argentinian who's worried about hundred percent inflation or collapse of your currency or potentially even foreign governments that are increasingly wary of how the U S government weaponizes access to dollars for things like central bank reserves. Um, so I think Bitcoin will feel that niche. Uh, but you might be interested to know that to your point about original point about Netscape, most of the 
dynamism and interesting stuff in the crypto industry has sort of moved on from Bitcoin. And it's more about yeah. smart contracts and tokens. If Ether and is I, a like good example. Ether. Yeah. And, and the, the, you know, the, right now on Ethereum, you have everything from cryptocurrencies to dollars, to stocks, to bonds, to tokens that represent real estate, to sports memorabilia, and the list goes on and on. And I'm, and the bulk of my book is actually, it talks a lot about money and Bitcoin, but it's really like, I think the important question now is what else can we do with this thing? This yeah. Blockchain crypto thing. That's, that's, that's perhaps not as controversial as money, right? Like I, I think if I told you that maybe about, well, I have a whole chapter on this in the book that soon enough because of networks like Ethereum and other ones, you'll be able to send dollars, 24 seven for free to anyone, anywhere. And that all, you know, like everybody who gets a paycheck, you have to wait two days. Checks take five days to clear credit cards look like they happen in real time, but the store doesn't get the money until Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Dollars, things. Yeah. Right. If you can stream dollars for free, everybody wins. Well, except the credit card companies that charge 2% fees. Right. <laughs> we're okay with that. It, it, it is, this opens up a whole world of, uh, we'll use the, uh, the World Wide Web again. Uh, travel agents had to look mm. at, at online booking of flights and just the, where are they? Now you mm. have a few travel agents that specialize in maybe high-end travel where I'm some rich guy and say, look, I want to go to, you know, have a balloon safari for 25 people, but go do it. <laughs> but, but for the average person, look, I got to go to Phoenix. I'm going on Delta and I'm booking my stuff. So when I look at DeFi uh, yeah. and this technology, when you blend the ability to do all these things with decentralized finance, I see no more need for a New York stock exchange as I do a travel agent to book my Delta. I see no need for that where why, I mean, eBay, I can, I can, you know, use an, you know, eBay or I could use a different medium. And so if there's a more efficient medium other than the New York stock exchange or the NASDAQ or clearing and the, the incredible complexity of clearing houses and all the things that happen behind the scenes when you feel like you're buying a, a share of stock, the share stock actually might be yours rather than just credited uh, as a debit to what they owe you on a ledger, much like a bank. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, that's a fascinating. And for some people, it's probably a frightening. The, the idea that I could use smart contracts with criteria for lending. And, and so rather than a bank reviewing a loan application, you could have an algorithm that, that analyzes certain criteria or needs to, there's certain criteria that needs to be accepted in order for you to earn money in a guaranteed way that you receive the money back. Man, alive, you could be your own. I mean, the debt market and the equity market, ownership and lending. I mean, it just, it, it takes more breath away to think about where it could go. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you were, you were, on Wall, you were a, a trader. Uh, does this take your breath away? It takes my breath away. I think, my gosh, uh, the potential mm -hmm. for this is incredible. Absolutely. Actually, a DeFi or decentralized finance, which is this ecosystem of using all the features of blockchain and crypto that we've talked about and applying it to things like people trading one thing for another or borrowing and lending. That's one of my favorite areas for the reason that you said, because I come from this trading background. I've always been fascinated by uh, market infrastructure. I actually, people are surprised to learn most of my book is not about crypto. Most of my book is about the history of things like the stock market. Like how is, how did the U S stock market come to be what it is with some, uh, interesting quirks that a lot of people don't know about. Like the fact that every single public company in the U S is technically owned by one corporation. Uh, and that's the depository trust and clearing company, DTCC. Yeah. Um, and, and they, you know, they have ledgers that say, okay, I own every share of Apple, but really some of these shares are for Robin hood and some are for Goldman Sachs and then Robin hood and Goldman Sachs say, okay, I own yeah. shares and some of them are for client A and client B. And that, there's actually a fascinating history of something in the U S called the paperwork crisis where things didn't used to be this centralized, but, uh, the, 
uh, the trading was too fast and the back office couldn't keep up in the 60s. And they actually had to start closing the New York Stock Exchange on Wednesday just to give the clerks a chance to keep up. And, and from that progression, we got to the world where we got today. We're ostensibly on the surface. It works, but then in a lot of ways it doesn't. Like, uh, here's a funny one for you. Why is the stock market close on the weekends? Because that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's actually it's a best, it's not to give yeah. traders the, the time off. It's it, because you know life happens on the weekend. Yeah. Well, options. Natural, uh, you have expiration Friday, but truth of the matter is settlement is on Saturday, right? Right. And and a lot of this is again like this idea that I call the book rearchitecting trust because mm-hmm. the architecture of finance is, is still the same as the days when people would, you know, have paper ledgers or make phone calls. And I'm old enough. So I was a trader during the 2008 financial crisis. And if you remember Lehman brothers yeah. filed for bankruptcy over the weekend. So the bankruptcy courts open. And this is the most important thing, arguably, to hit the U.S. financial system in many decades. And all anybody could do is sit there and twiddle their thumbs till the market opened on Monday. Yeah. Um, and when we move into this world of DeFi, and there are decentralized exchanges that in many ways, you know, they resemble the New York Stock Exchange in that it's a place where buyers and sellers congregate to find liquidity. But there are all these features where it's better. It's 24-7. It's global, meaning it's not just restricted to like brokerages licensed in America. The number of assets and securities and whatever you could have, uh, the biggest decentralized exchange on Ethereum is called Uniswap. I believe it now trades something like 75,000 different pairs of assets. So you have people trading dollars for Bitcoins or Bitcoins for Ether and then, and then maybe dollars for stocks and a lot of other esoteric things. And, Part of the beauty of moving stuff onto the blockchain is once you build an effective exchange, you can literally put anything on there. So there, there's actually, I think, markets for things like rewards tokens, right? Because you can put airline miles on the blockchain. And why not have a world where if you have 5,000 American airline miles, but you really want to buy a nice gift from a department store, there's a market where you can go and be like, hey, what, what would it cost to sell these and get these other rewards? Uh, so it starts from that. And other than a lot of efficiencies, the other great thing about DeFi, and this is an area of great interest in academia, is that DeFi enables financial products and models that couldn't otherwise exist. Yeah. And one example of one is something called an automated market maker. So in, in traditional, on the New York Stock Exchange or on the NASDAQ, yeah, you have professionals who are market yeah. makers, specialists, right? And their job is to provide liquidity for which, and that's a valuable thing, so they get paid to do it. In DeFi, there's a, because of the smart contracts and the code and everything, anybody could be a market maker. So there are places where, let's say, I actually use this, but let's say you had a little bit of Ether, the crypto, cryptocurrency, and you had some dollars, and they're both sitting around you could just submit them to the code and say, Hey, make a market on my behalf, charge a fee. And there's actually this new idea in DeFi where being a liquidity provider is now an asset class. Interesting. That is interesting stuff. Being a liquidity provider. So you're basically there. There's a new DeFi to be a market maker, to be a specialist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. it, It just, uh, and then traders show up. So you would, you, you provide liquidity in, in any two assets or more. Mm-hmm. And then traders show up and say, I want to buy this and I want to sell that. Now there's no free lunch as you and I both know. So there are risks and it's actually the same Certainly. exact risk mostly of any market maker. If the market suddenly there's a shock news event and spikes in one direction as a liquidity provider, you're going to be on the losing side of that. But that that's, fine, right? That's market making. I just love this idea that an activity that used to previously be limited to a very niche group of people on wall street is now something that anyone who has idle assets sitting around could participate in. Uh, two more things will hit, uh, FTX. Mm. Could you give some commentary on, on, well, not just, I guess it's not just FTX. Here's an interesting thought. You have volatility, uh, that is just 
I mean, it's it's as volatile as, as anything else, I suppose. Uh, up, down, up, down, up, down, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, mm-hmm. it, it goes up and down. So people say, well, I want something stable. So here's what's weird. I want to participate in a decentralized place. I want to participate in a place that is, you know, not human controlled, but I don't want the volatility. And since we don't have massive adoption to change U.S. dollars to to Bitcoin and then Bitcoin back to U.S. dollars, financial institutions aren't fans of that. Uh, we invent this idea uh, called a stable coin, which is a fascinating name. It's a very nice name, a stable. It, it has implications. <laughs> and so now I, I go out and I have a stable coin. Ironically, so I, I hold all, so I want to trade this volatile asset that I don't want the volatility, but I want the decentralization. So what do I do? I go to a centralized, uh, private, non audited <laughs> right? Non audited yeah, ledger, non regulated, yep. stable coin. Uh, who's who's audit who's being audited as we speak by an auditing firm that's being audited in themselves, right? That was invented by an actor who played in the Mighty Ducks as a child. Uh, to me, that's just it's just incredible. They've already been uh, fined once by saying, "Well, yeah, we we probably took some of this money and we loaned it to ourselves." So when we say we're backed by commercial paper, well, it was paper that we made loans to another entity that we had, and they slapped their hands and said, "Give us a few million to to make up for that." So you kind of know who's running it, right? They're willing to do that stuff. To me, um, I'll tell you what, that's an interesting story. So talk a little bit about FTX. Talk a little bit about the mischief. Uh, side of this stuff that yeah trustless is supposed to be trustless but these guys aren't trustworthy some of them can you talk about that a little bit yeah and you were actually describing the first and still the largest but losing market share fast stable coin and and for your for your listener the stable coin is just when you say i want for whatever reason trading bitcoin is the main one tether other yeah tether but it's if you want to put dollars, how do you put dollars on the blockchain? Well, you create a digital token and you say this is redeemable one for one for dollars deposited in a bank account or held in treasuries, right? Ideally, that model is fine. It's actually like how PayPal works and how Venmo right. works. And for thousands of years, people have been making payments by swapping claims on some kind of a reserve. Actually, you would know this, that the origins of paper money came from when people would deposit their gold, gold for safekeeping yes. at a money changer or a bank and they get a receipt that said, this, you know, this can be redeemed for one coin or whatever. Uh, and then at some point they're like, Hey, instead of going back let's to let's do a fraction, and, <laughs> let's do fraction. No, yeah. That, well, that, that before, but before we got there, it was this idea that people started swapping the receipts as payment. Right. Right. The, right. The one person's like, Hey, I could go to the bank and get the gold and give it to you, but why don't I just give you the paper and you exactly. go get it, right. A paper check is based on the same idea. So as far as the financial model of a, ideal stable coin there's nothing remotely controversial there it's doable and there are newer more trustworthy more regulated issuers uh who've come since tether who don't do all the shady stuff that tether does uh, and i'm actually i think in time all dollars and euros and all the currencies will become stable coins and then we just won't won't call them stable coins we'll just call them dollars in the same way that like i don't call my my PayPal balance, PayPal dollars, yeah, say their dollar, yeah. Um, but both Tether and FTX. Well, although FTX, I, I actually let me talk about FTX because FTX is 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 shady even by crypto standards, and there's a <laughs> lot of shady that's like Tether. But Tether, for what it's worth, has been around for years, and people have used it, and it's worked. Maybe someday it won't. And that's, and that's, to their credit, the fear. And to their credit, they have had tests of liquidity before. I mean, they have had tests and exactly. they have passed yeah. They have passed some pretty, not, not just stress tests, but like actual tests of their right. liquidity. Absolutely. Um, and I still, look, I don't use it because there are better options. And, but there's a reason why a lot of people use Tether. It's popular in gray markets in places like Asia where people yeah. want dollars without anybody asking too many questions. But FTX 
the exchange, this is even by crypto standards, it's a whole other level. And it really is just a massive fraud. Or, or more likely, it's just theft by Sam Bankman Fried and his colleagues. They, it's this amazing human story where they held themselves out as like the saints of crypto. You know, they donated money to politicians. They bought themselves a lot of positive attention and went on all the podcast tours talking about effective altruism and cleaning up crypto and doing crypto better. And then they turned out to be the biggest crooks the industry has ever seen. <laughs> Incredible. Um, so it's a major black guy and it, it raises a couple of questions. And these are the questions people ask me. One, why use the cryptocurrency exchange to begin with, which is the cryptocurrency exchanges. This is not DeFi. It's not a decentralized exchange, right? FTX is a lot closer to the New York stock exchange than, than it is to something on Ethereum. And, and there are legitimate and illegitimate reasons to use these exchanges. Um, the legitimate one is that, and you alluded to this, it, it's because I can't call up JP Morgan and say, can I buy Bitcoins with my checking account? The cryptocurrency exchanges, which are also good ones, they act as the on and off ramps to this crypto world. Like they tie into the traditional banking system in many countries, and then they tie into the crypto system, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, et cetera. But then once you use them, go back to the first thing that I said, my first epiphany was when I actually withdrew my assets from the exchange. And part of the reason I did that, by the way, nine years ago, wasn't because I thought Coinbase would be a fraud, but cryptocurrency exchanges often get hacked. Uh, there are these honeypots because they're holding a lot of coins for a lot of people. And if you can figure out how to breach their internal sec security, you can steal their Bitcoins. And they have a lot of them. And because this is decentralized, there's no refunds. So the technology does enable everyone to take ownership of their own assets, but that's not without its pitfalls because just like the dollars in my wallet, if I lose my wallet, they're gone. Mm. So one of the takeaways of the many from this whole FTX thing is that we need much better solutions to enable people and, and actually more problematic is institutions. Cause I do. And many, a lot of my friends who use crypto, we keep our own coins in our own devices a hedge fund or a pension fund can't do that because then it's like, you no, know, you can't have the CFO walk around with a billion dollars of Bitcoin in his wallet and his phone or something. You need controls, you need maker checker systems, you need continuity. So hopefully with better infrastructure, we're not going to need as many <clears throat> or have to rely on exchanges. And I will say this, and this is another area where I'll disagree with a lot of crypto people there are parts of crypto that should be regulated because you know, the, the FTX is not trustless. The exchange does not give me the same yeah. security assurance as that the blockchain does, yeah. yep. which means we need governments to make sure the very human people making the decisions don't turn out to be crooks. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. We agree on so many points. It's interesting <laughs> to talk to a rational person about crypto. It's kind of fun. Um, we do exist. <laughs> you know, <laughs> There's so much more we could do with this. You've been way liberal with your time. There's questions of, you know, marriage. We love immutable things. Till death you part, better, worse, sickness and in health. You know, bonded, welded. You're together until you die, until you don't want to be together anymore. You know, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful to say we're only going to have this many Bitcoin until you have to borrow a bunch of it to deal with a pandemic mm -hmm. or a war. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a really nice thing to have something that's immutable until you want to change it. And so these are fascinating conversations. It's, you know, we could talk for five weeks on it, re-architecting trust, the curse of history and the crypto cure for money markets and platforms. Money's evolved. And I will, I will say this, uh, perhaps knowledge is the new money. Things are changing so quickly when it comes to Warren Buffett, they've poo pooed crypto and the way I don't poo poo it in the same way they do. I would just say this uh, for those that feel the FOMO, be careful, the, the fear of missing out. Listen, absolutely. When, when I grew up uh, in the seventies, uh, I, I came into adulthood in the nineties. So the World Wide web, you know, I'm, you know, 30 or whatever I am. And, and when the World Wide web hit, uh, there was a lot of hype about how the internet would make you rich. 
Um, no, the internet is going to be very useful for you to conduct your life better than it did before. But everyone was saying, no, the internet's going to make the average person rich. So I went down to a WebEx crypto slash DeFi Web3 conference. And it, it was like going back in time to the 90s. It was incredible. It wasn't mm. about how much anybody had actually made. They were bragging about how much money they had raised for their project. In other words, the credibility had come because what they'd done, the credibility had become through the investor. Well, you know, smart people invested in this. There's, they've raised $20 million. So, you know, smart people must see this. I met better invest too. And it reminded me of Silicon Valley and the dot-com bust ready to happen. We had people selling uh, services for NFTs. Be careful with that stuff. You know, a, a guy's going to take your, your fungible uh, gold eagle and he's going to scan it with a microscopic laser, you know, microscope to find that fungible coin's flaws to create a digital certificate that is now non-fungible. So even if you sell your coin, you still have digital rights to it on the blockchain and you get a commission every time that thing trades hands. I mean, crazy, you know, cra crazy stuff. Be careful, FOMO, and just realize this. Where I side with Warren Buffett a little bit is gold is an interesting thing. He once said, we take a bunch, like be on Mars and watch this happen. You take a, a, a bunch of guys and dig a hole and you pull out this shiny rock and then you pay someone to bring it up out of the ground, kind of make it a little more shiny. Then you go to Kentucky and you dig another hole called Fort Knox and you bury that gold uh, in the new hole and pay someone to guard it and smile about the whole thing. And where Buffett and Munger, I think, are right is that if I own shares of Apple, whether that's shares in an old style paper certificate or whether it's credit on my ledger at, at uh, you know, interactive brokers or whether I have it as some digital now form, I'm still serving people by providing phones, computers, and Apple Pay. If I own Kraft Heinz, uh, people still want to put ketchup on their French fries, even in the digital world. And so serving people is how you become wealthy. And if you can educate yourself on the new technologies that allow us to do that, your getting rich is going to come through serving people. I recommend the book, Rearchitecting Trust, The Curse of History, and The Crypto Cure for Money Markets and, and Platforms uh, by Omid Malikan. Uh, because in this world, maybe crypto is the new money. I think knowledge uh, is the new money. The ability to keep pace and learn and adapt and not take your college degree and say, well, I, I did that learning part of my life. That's over now. Learning has never been more important. Could you finish by talking a little bit about the, I mean, you're a teacher, you teach this every day, the absolute lifeblood of knowledge and understanding as these new technologies settle in who becomes the new google who becomes the new amazon who becomes the facebook you know who adopts these things how do you see that coming what is the importance of knowledge and continued learning in this world i think the most important thing is actually to realize that the understanding will serve you better than the knowledge and, and what i mean by that is one of the challenges of writing about this topic or even teaching it is that it changes so much yeah. by the day almost. And like you said, there, there's a lot of hype that turns out to be not true. There are a lot of people who push certain ideas that at best turn out to be comically wrong in the next cycle or at worst turn out to be just frauds and ponzi's and what I think is the most important thing for all of your listeners and, and me and you is to tr you really like try to try to build a general understanding of what's happening here, what the potential implications are. I tell my students both in the first and last class to be okay, be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I feel like it's, it's almost required. And I, I mean, imagine like you go back, over a hundred years and the people who are trying to grapple with what something like the electrification of the economy could mean, right? And the same yeah. thing with when 
30 years ago, people really try to envision like what does a digital world, but the, in the world where anybody can communicate and access all the world's information, what does that mean? And, and crypto has its own version of that, like you said. And of course, I think everybody should read my book. But other than that, I think I'm totally with you. The Be very careful with the investment and FOMO part of this, if nothing else. My advice to anyone who wants to invest is assume everything in crypto is a scam and work your way backwards. Mm-hmm. See, see what the idea is. Uh, see who the people, what, what's the caliber of the people behind it. But more importantly, ultimately, what does this mean for you as an individual, as an entrepreneur, as an employee, as a voter? The, the theory that I present in the book is that in the long run, Um, crypto will become the underpinnings of not just the financial system, but many parts of the economy, just because it's a better way to build trust. And that's going to mean great opportunities for those who take the time to learn about it, to digest it, and to build the right mental model. Well, we certainly appreciate you increasing our understanding of this, you know, where things go. As you mentioned, the obsolescence risk, I think, is is a huge part of this because tomorrow is things change. They'll be different than today. And that requires a, a comfort with discomfort, or at least a comfort with change. You know, uh, humans like stability, you know, hence stable coins. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we, we, we don't get to have as much stability in a world that is exponentially changing. We've been speaking with Omid uh, Malikan, he is a adjunct professor at uh, the Columbia Business School and author of Rearchitecting Trust, The Curse of History and the Crypto Cure for Money, Markets and Platforms. We thank you so much for your time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tanner. This is where we do our very best to make investing simple. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.